Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. This is Ann Cuppinger, and I'm with uh, Managed Care Technical Assistance Center and the Community Technical Assistance Center. Um, and I'm here today with uh, my colleague, Yvette Kelly, and we're really excited to be uh, sharing this webinar with you on the progress note, a critical component of care. I want to let everyone know that the PDF of the slides for this webinar are on the CTAC website. If you look at the calendar under upcoming events and uh, under today's date, you'll see this webinar listed, and there you should also find the slides. Uh, we'll also follow the usual practice of sending you a link to those documents um, in a couple of days, but if folks want to have them now, uh, those are available on the CTAC website. Also, uh, most of you are probably familiar by now with how these webinars work, but um, we invite you to use the chat box to send us any questions that you might have that come up as we're going through the webinar, and we'll leave some time at the end of the webinar to address as many of those questions as we can. If you don't see your chat box, you'll see at the upper uh, right-hand corner of your screen, a speech bubble, and it says chat under it. If you click on that, it should open up the chat box, and you can send your questions to um, everyone or to all the panelists, um, and that will allow us to respond to as many of those as possible at the end of the webinar. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this webinar is being presented by the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center. And the next couple of slides uh, will show you some of the partners who are involved uh, with MCTAC and who were all involved in putting together this series on documentation. This is webinar, webinar number four out of six in the documentation series. So if you're joining us for the first time, um, you'll find links to the previous webinars on the website, and also you can register for upcoming webinars in the documentation series. Right now, we're going to ask a couple poll questions so we have an idea of who's on the call and a little couple of questions about your familiarity and comfortable level of comfort with documentation. So if everyone can take a couple of minutes, you should see those poll questions now. Uh, there are three poll questions, multiple choice, easy for the middle of the week, The poll is going to be closing in just a few seconds, so if you haven't had a chance to answer those poll questions, I encourage you to do so now. And while we're finishing that, and while uh, Jocelyn is tabulating the results of the poll, I'll let you know the date of uh, two of the uh, upcoming webinars in this series. Um, on January 25th uh, at noon, we're going to be talking about the role of supervisors in supporting high-quality documentation. That's been a theme throughout the webinar series, but it's really going to be a focus on how supervisors can support their staff um, to uh, do documentation in a way that's consistent with best practices. And on February 15th, also at noon, we'll have office hours where um, any of the questions that we haven't answered um, along the way um, can be addressed uh, in more detail.
Okay. So uh, the poll is closed, and in just a minute, we'll have the results of the poll. I always feel at this point as if I should have a song prepared for you. Um, but it'll give you an opportunity to visit the CTAC website if you want and download the slides uh, for taking notes if that's something that you like to do. So Jocelyn's asking me if I can see the results of the poll, and I can't. So Jocelyn, maybe you could share. Can you share the results of the poll with folks? They're not showing up on my screen. I hit apply, so I'm not sure. It looks like they should be showing. Sorry. We can just move on. Okay. Sorry, everybody. We'll, uh, we'll share the results of the poll with you at some other time, um, and uh, we'll move on. So we're, the, the purpose of this uh, particular webinar is to talk about um, progress notes specifically. So other, you know, there's lots of pieces of documentation. The progress note is obviously a really important component of documentation, but not the only thing. Um, and, you know, it's really important to underscore how important documentation is. It is, um, you know, all of the components are required for a number of reasons. They may be required for legal reasons. They're certainly required for billing purposes. Uh, they really help um, with treatment planning and with creating a record of what's happened with the clients that you work with. So it's, it's, uh, it's such an a critical and important topic that uh, we've had a lot of interest in it, and that's why we're doing um, this webinar. Some providers have a lot of experience with documentation, and they've been making adaptations along the way to what would be higher standards for documentation. And some folks are newer to that, so they're kind of moving from a more casual approach to documentation to something more formal, and that's what this series is um, helping people adapt to that change. So, you know, the other really important part of documentation, other than the sort of technical reasons that it's important, is that it, documentation is really tied into the quality of care. And one of the things that, you know, we want to look at in the documentation is whether or not the documentation reflects that the work that we're doing is consistent with best practices on, around a number of things, but including these really important areas of being person and family-centered, trauma-informed, and recovery and resiliency-oriented. So there is sometimes a little back and forth between what we do and what we write. And we want to be sure that what we write is consistent with what we do and that what we do is consistent with best practices in these and other areas. So when we're looking at person and family-centered, we would expect to see in documentation that providers are illustrating how they're practicing these values. So how is the client having input into their treatment plan? How is the client having input into how things are going and what the next steps ought to be in terms of the work that you as a provider are doing with them? The, the uh, progress notes should look like they are unique to that individual. So they shouldn't look like cookie-cutter progress notes, but should really reflect that you're responding to the unique circumstances, the unique strengths, the needs of each person that you're working with and each family that you're working with if you're working with a family. The notes should be respectful, and the language that you use should show positive regard for the person and their journey, maybe even sometimes their difficult journey, but they should reflect that philosophy. Your notes should also suggest that you are aware of the impact of trauma in the lives of many of the individuals that you work with, that this is a topic that you brought up with the folks that you work with, and that you, together with that person, have made a plan for how you, in your work with them, are going to respond to where they're at in terms of their trauma history. So do you have a plan for if what you're doing upsets them? Do they have a plan? for how they're going to manage their reaction to trauma in their day-to-day -day life. That should show up in your notes as well. Also, your progress notes should reflect your recovery and resiliency orientation in your work. And sometimes people wonder exactly what this means. I mean, part of it means that you are having conversations with the person that you work with about what recovery looks like to them um, and helping them help you define the goals of treatment. It also means that you're going to be working really closely in partnership with them as they are the experts in their own lives and looking at their whole life. So while you may have a limited role in your work with them, 
your note should reflect the fact that you understand that recovery and resiliency encompasses all aspects of their life and that you're willing to work in collaboration with the other people who may be part of their support network to make that happen for them. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Yvette Kelly and uh, she's gonna talk about the golden thread. Thank you, Anne. Um, hello, everyone. And so um, if this is your first time um, participating with us during the documentation series, uh, this might be your first time hearing it, but um, uh, for, for most of you, I'm going to assume that it's not. When we talk about the golden thread, and so this is something that I wanted to start with because it really is an essential concept, again, that, that should not be underscored. And so basically the, the golden thread around documentation is that each piece of documentation should flow, should flow logically from one another such that the reason why the individual and or family um, is seeking treatment um, is congruent with kind of interventions and um, the work that you're going to be doing um, in therapy or in treatment. Um, and all of that stuff is congruent with the diagnosis. And so all of that is aligned. Um, and so that's very important. And, and again, I, I think um, just to stress that the progress note is really um, a crucial piece of that. Um, and so the progress note is actually what connects your, the provider's work and treatment um, with the diagnosis and established treatment goals. So it's, it's like the blueprint uh, for the work that you're going to be doing. And so uh, we're going to start there and just talk about um, that if we think from a, a larger perspective. Um, when we talk about progress notes, we are really talking about, and you see on this slide that there's uh, many different names that people call progress notes, but really a contact note. So when you are meeting with an individual and a family and you're working with um, individuals and families on particular goals and, um, and when you're providing a service, how, how is it that you go about documenting that? Um, as Ann mentioned, one of the reasons that we um, did this series was really because we've gotten a lot of questions in the past around progress notes, and we recognize that this is an area um, in which sometimes providers struggle, and I think the struggle comes around um, discriminating what should go in and should not go in a progress note, um, and then just really thinking about that from a time perspective. And so I, when I used to supervise clinicians, one of the things that I used to um, explain to them about progress notes is that there is a way to do this in a relatively brief and concise way such that um, it doesn't really take a lot of time to get those elements into the progress that note that you need. Um, but there are certain key elements that do need to be included as we go along in this presentation. Uh, we'll talk more about what those are. And so the progress note is really an, the evidence of services that you provide to or on behalf of an individual and or family. And it relates to their progress and treatment. So really, um, you know, what, what is it that you're doing with the individual? And again, this kind of relates back to that old cliche, is that if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. Really, so again, the progress note is really the evidence that you are providing a service, right? It's what we use to determine that. Um, but it also contains the necessary details to support medical necessity, right, of each service that you deliver and subsequently bill in some environments. And so um, medical necessity, we have to understand it, you know, provides the rationale around why treatment is necessary, and that's imperative to have in the documentation. Um, and so we wanna really talk about that in terms of why uh, that's important to kind of build up on um, in this section. So what does the progress note entail? So the, I think the easiest way to frame kind of some of these essential elements in the progress note is to really look at it from these kind of four perspectives, right? So there's a, a piece of the progress note that uh, requires some compliance and medical necessity um, information that we just kind of talked about. Um, but then there's also the functional status and symptoms uh, of the individual or family that you're treating um, that's required. 
And also, um, as, ma- as Ann mentioned in the beginning, we we're talking about person-centered and family-centered. We, ought- we also want to make sure that we are including the families or the individual's preferences, their input, and that in some way that gets relayed through the paperwork and through the notes, and uh, we'll talk about how that's done. And, and we also want to remember uh, that the pro- provider has certain expertise um, and training in certain areas in that you know, um, we're utilizing that and really uh, incorporating that into the note as well. So lots of different kind of elements go into the note, and I get a lot of questions sometimes, and, you know, when people look at this, they say, well, it sounds like, you know, that's going to be a very, a, a long-winded note. But, again, this is uh, – you can incorporate these elements with brevity. And so um, there is an example that we do provide in this uh, webinar, and you'll see that at the end that shows how you can do that. I think the key to that really uh, is learning what to discriminate to put in and, you know, what should be included in the note um, and what is not necessarily uh, necessary for you to include in the note and then being concise and brief. So let's take a moment to focus on some of those um, compliance and medical necessity elements of the progress note. So this goes without saying, but there should be a progress note for each session that you have. Um, whenever you see an individual, and, and again, uh, you know, if there's something, um, in, you know, pertinent that you should be documenting, um, even if the individual's not, you know, you haven't seen them face to face, that should be included as well. Um, notes can be written in either the first or third person. Should reflect activities that are within your scope of practice. All right, and so what that means is that you should only be providing services for which you are um, qualified to provide. Uh, relates back to the treatment and service plan again, think, thinking about that golden thread. What was the reason that they came in? What did you assess? Um, and how did you build the treatment plan? So all of that should logically flow. And documented time and dates in your progress note should really coincide with goals identified in the treatment. Um, and for this purpose, we'll say service plan because sometimes people use those words interchangeably um, for that time period. A lot of times what happens is you know, these things are um, dynamic, they're always changing, but you'll find that sometimes providers are not keeping up with the change. You know, the paperwork, the treatment plan, the progress note is not being reflective of some of the changes that is happening. And so, um, again, Ann mentioned, again, it shouldn't really be like a cookie cutter. It should really be individualized and specific. And also just to note that, um, you know, and, and I'm going to come from the perspective of a, of a children's behavioral health or a clinic because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, in terms of um, treatment plan timelines. So, you know, w- regulations do have a minimum time frame for which uh, uh, treatment plans should be completed, like in a clinic they need to be completed every 90 days. But nothing precludes anyone from changing the treatment plan at any point in time before that. And so I always uh, want people to be mindful that you don't necessarily have to wait the 90 days to make a change in treatment plan, that you can do that at any particular time. And so if you're, um, you know, if you're working with an individual and it requires that level of change and detail, that the paperwork and treatment plan and the progress note should be reflective of that. So minimally, we need to include the date of service as self-explanatory, that that's the date that you actually delivered the service. Uh, usually there's a service code, so uh, what's the reimbursable service that you're providing? The name of the identif- um, identified service recipient, so whoever is the, um, the individual who is generally enrolled in the program. Um, duration, time spent providing that service. And again, your reason for, for contact of the service, the purpose of meeting with the um, individual and family, and that's usually tied, again, to what you assess and to the treatment plan. And then lastly, your signature and credentials, so um, this, that you have the authority to provide this service. And so um, this needs to be, this is kind of like a minimal standard, you need to ensure that you sign the progress note. So we talked about... Um, being able to um, reflect an individual's preferences and their input. And so what that really means is that um, in the note we should, you know, identify the family's preferences, their wishes, uh, what it is that they, they want um, from, from the service. Uh, 
we also need to provide evidence that they've collaborated with the provider in determining their, dis their service delivery needs. And so it's, that does not always mean that families and individuals, uh, you know, always agree with the provider, and that's okay. But I think um, if, they, if there's some uh, discrepancy between what the provider feels is needed and what the family wishes to work on, um, which happens, that there should be some way, some way to capture that um, in the note. And again, so that we can um, relay that we have actually collaborated with the family, right? And that because of this collaboration, you know, we as a provider might assess that they um, need to work on this, but they've identified that they're not interested in working on that right now. And because of that, that we're going we're gonna to work on this goal. Um, you also want to provide the details about what the um, individual or family has done or accomplished or, or struggled with, all right, and so um, give some update on that. So sometimes this, you can provide information here around, you know, history of um, the service provision and, and not so detailed that it ta it's a half of page. This is not, a progress note is not necessarily um, like a, a, an assessment, right, a full-length uh, assessment, but it is, a, a, you do touch upon this stuff um, if it's pertinent to that particular service and to that particular session. And so you might want to, in the note, detail that, you know, this family has a history of working with multiple providers. And because of that, they're very, um, you know, they're, they're very um, standoffish with providers and, you know, that has come through in the session. So you kind of want to pull a little pertinent, I think that's the key, pertinent elements um, into that, into the note. And again, that can be very done in a very succinct way. But also, if there's, um, you know, some, a, a strength that you have recognized um, in that, you know, uh, despite, you know, what the family has gone through, they're still motivated and engaged. Well, let's, let's talk about that as well. And I think that the key to that is let's talk about how we can utilize that and treatment um, to get some movement on, on, you know, helping them achieve some of their other goals. You also want to describe the individual's family's responses to the recommendations or, or interventions. So, you know, how does the family view their work with the provider, right? Uh, do they feel that you as, as a provider have accommodated for any cultural differences um, that they may feel may be necessary? Um, and do they find the interventions helpful and applicable to them? Uh, sometimes, you know, it takes us a while to figure out what's going to work with an individual, with a family. So if we don't ask these questions, sometimes our, the people that we're working with are not necessarily um, going to be upfront and tell us that. So like we have to be diligent in making sure that we ask those questions and we check in with our with the people that we're working you know, our, um, with individuals and families to ensure that we're on the right path. And again, so you want to note that if something, um, if you planned an intervention that you thought was going to work really well but culturally it's not appropriate for them, you, you might want to note that in, in the record, and in part because if this family ever seeks services somewhere else, that would be really helpful for a new provider to have some awareness of. So just kind of those, those little mentions of those things. Um, you also want to include those who are significant to the individual's uh, and family's treatment. So, you know, who, who is it that's going to be accompanying the child, the family? Is there a neighbor down the street who, um, who is really a natural support for this family and is really going to, you know, help the family to kind of meet their goals? Also want to note those things because that's going to be important. And so the, it should really answer the who, what, where, how, and when. Right, so your, your your note should be clear about all of those things, um, and not real, and not merely just a play by play of the interaction that you had with the individual. And so, because um, there's a difference, and I think it's important that we understand that difference. And the difference is sometimes people tell you what happened, like you know, client came into the session, they sat down, they um, we talked about this, we did this, but they really don't tell you, you know. They really don't link that back to the goals, right? And in doing that, that really creates a really lengthy pro um, process in note writing. And so that's the piece where you really have to learn kind of what goes in, what goes out, you know, what comes out, and then think about targeting um, those key details because that's how you get it to be brief, but you include everything that you need to include.
So you're also going to talk about any functional status, any symptoms that, that are going on. So how does the individual um, currently present, right? Are they currently in crisis? Is there any significant issue going on? You know, what their moods are like? Um, any relevant history, right? So anything, again, and I gave an example earlier, anything that's pertinent to that session, that day. Um, your interventions need to be included in a note. So what did you do? So essentially the question is what are people paying for, right? It could be the managed care organization. It could be, you know, the commercial provider. But the question is what are they paying for? What did you do in that session that requires reimbursement? If you think of it like that, um, it'd be help it's helpful to kind of frame your actions versus, again, just kind of giving like this history of, you know, our play-by-play -play of the session. Um, any results of any clinical tests or assessments that you're using and, and, um, it, and how you're going to measure progress. I think this is a part of um, measuring progress. You know, if you're going to, you know, how are you going to know people met their goals? So what tools are you using? That would be important. Um, any, any plans or next steps? Right. So, what what do you what do you plan to do next? What do you you know what are you going to work with um, the family on next? The family or the individual, and then progress to date. And so, it's important to talk about where the family is. You've been working with them. You've been um, you know focused on meeting particular goal areas. So, where are they in that um, progress? And it's and it's important to note that there are times where families make little to no progress towards goals and, and objectives. And that's perfectly fine to put into a note. I think the second piece of that note, though, is to describe why that is. So, you know, what is what are some of the barriers um, such that the family are, are you know, having difficult, difficulty attaining goals? Are the goals realistic, right? Did you shoot for the stars? Or did we just go a little too far? Do we need to refine them? Um, you know, did something significant happen in that individual family flight that we need to just kind of, you know, make some mid-course corrections? We need to we need to think about that. Um, and then I think the other piece of that is to, important to indicate how you, as the um, provider, in collaboration with the family, how we're mitigating those issues, right? So we, we recognize this is this is a barrier to meeting a goal. You know, spoke with the family, the, the family and the provider agreed. Like, so what is it that you're doing? And I think that's a important that's an important piece that is often missed in writing the notes. But to understand, you know, we've recognized this, but here's our next step. Here's what we're gonna do, here's how we're gonna gonna mitigate that. And then also we want to talk about any additional um, services or resources that we're going to recommend. If you're recommending they go for a psychiatric, if you're recommending they go to a community service uh, provider, anything that you, that you think is necessary. Parenting class, you just kind of want to um, detail that recommendation and, under, and um, identify why you think it's important. And while um, it's important also to um, you know, you won't be submitting necessarily billing for um, missed appointments. It is imperative that you kind of uh, note when families miss appointments. Um, and, and that's because you want to kind of have a flow of, of what's going on in the case. And so missed appointments should definitely be noted in the record. And um, it should also be what should also be documented in that process is any follow-up activities that you've done uh, when appointments are missed. So, for example, if you had an uh, individual or family who was not particularly engaged in the service and they uh, missed appointments, and you know, when so when they were expected to see you, they didn't come in, but then you called them, you followed up, you followed up with another provider to check on their well-being. Those are things that you want to. Uh, note in the record. Again, you won't necessarily be billing for that um, activity, but it, it does go a long way in terms of case coordination and, and some of the efforts that you've done to um, try to link them back to services. And so next, we just want to briefly uh, show you an example of a progress note, which contains all of the essential elements. And I, you know, we can't really read this uh, for the purposes of this webinar. However, this will be available for you to uh, download. But really is just an example. I do want to point out some things in this note. But an example of how you can really write with brevity and include those um, essential elements um, as it relates to working with, working with families and where you can be clear. Um, 
And so this, this note really kind of does that very succinctly. Um, and, and so if you have an opportunity or if you're struggling with how it is that we can accommodate all of this information, because, you know, if you, you know, look back, it looks like there's a lot of information to be included in, in some ways there, there is. Um, but you can really uh, get a note done in, in about, in, you know, and this is probably on the longer side um, of a note. But, and, and let me stress, it really is hard to put every single detail um, in terms of, you know, if they are working with like a family peer advocate, although that is detailed in here, um, in a sample note, but this should give you uh, a good reference for, for doing so. And just a reminder that your notes, again, should always link back to your treatment plan, right? And the golden thread should always be evident. And I would add to that 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 note nicely looks at some of those values in terms of being person-centered and family-centered, um, uh, you know, trauma-informed, and also uh, looking at recovery and resiliency. It does take a look at multiple aspects of Chris and Chris's family's life. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And I think, um, you know, some of the wording in this, in this note in particular is like, how do you, the question is like, how do you know that the family had input? And, you know, you use words like provider and, and, and you know, Mrs. Young for this point, um, collaborated, agreed, we spoke. So you kind of, it, it does kind of give you that frame for um, a way of making sure that you incorporated those foundational elements, again, like Anne said, into the note. And so just a few things to remember. Um, remember that when you submit uh, reimbursement for, um, for services that you build, that it is an attestation that the following criteria are met. And it, the first is that you've actually provided the service that relates to medical necessity, their goals, their objectives, what's in the treatment plan, um, and that you've actually completed and, and filed the note for that service. And so I think that's just important to note. And also, you know, when, we, when we're looking at progress notes, this is kind of one of the misconceptions over time as well, is rem I think the important piece to remember is that each note must be able to stand on its own regarding medical necessity. And so um, there's a lot of questions, well, you know, that was earlier in the chart or that's later in the chart. But knowing that if you're going to be um, submitting for reimbursement for a service, each note really has to stand on its own um, as it relates to medical necessity. So it's not sufficient that the goal um, and objective is in the treatment plan but not noted on the progress note. And so that's just a piece to remember. Um, and we also have to remember uh, the, the whole reason of why we document, right? We, we document not for the sake of documenting, although I know sometimes it feels like that, but that's not really why we document. We document from a clinical perspective um, so, that, so that provides us a history with, that the therapist can use in reviewing the course of treatment, but we also document because it is, it is the individual's or family's, you know, record, um, record of their, their history of their services. And so we want to make sure that we are documenting that to the best of our ability because people will actually need their records, right? They will actually come for those records or need some um, understanding of the services they received at some point in time, and we want to make sure that we're compliant and helping them, um, you know, make sure that that is complete. So uh, just, a, just a word that, you know, it really is important for, you know, the, the folks that we're working with that we are really documenting the care that we're providing um, so that when they need to reference that care, it's, it's available and it's there and um, it's understandable. So. Uh, just just to be mindful and, and also to be mindful that um, in our field there's a lot of turnover unfortunately and uh, what happens sometimes is if the record if the notes are not clear in terms of the interventions the services the needs all of that stuff we really um, subject the family to going back and kind of redoing some of that stuff which is not efficient for them it's not efficient for us um, and so we want to make sure that, you know, our, that our records are complete and accurate such that if for some, if for some reason 
um, you know, I leave the agency or something happens to me medically and someone has to come in and fill in on my shoes, that they can look at the record, they can look at the last note and say, ah, I got a good starting place for where this family is. That's how clear the notes um, should be. And so we want to make sure that we put our colleagues in the best uh, position possible to provide uninterrupted quality services. And again, we want to make sure that um, that record is complete and accurate for the families and individuals who will need those records for a multitude of things. And so I, I just want to remind um, people of that, the importance of that. There are also special situations in which you will write a progress note, and I just kind of wanted to de detail these um, real quick because sometimes you will have to add more or less uh, in this note because of the type of note that it is. And so I wanted to talk briefly about, um, so you know, sometimes you will need a progress note for crisis services, which will pro provide uh, more detailed information around status and uh, on those things. Uh, a progress note for group services, will, which will look a bit different. Um, as well as a progress note for, ter for termination and transition. And I also just want to highlight a resource that is available uh, that some of you may be aware of, but wanted to let you know that um, this link right here provides uh, information around NISCRI. And if you're not familiar with that, it's the New York State Rec Clinical Record Initiative. And so they have already um, forms that meet all of the criteria that need to be met in terms of um, the required elements that you could utilize for different programs um, for different types of notes. So if you were someone who wanted a particular format, that's a great place to go. They have guidance around it. Um, it's, not, it's not required right now, um, it, but it is, it's a great resource. Um, so I just want to kind of highlight that. And then we'll provide some, uh, so that's the link to it, but there's some uh, screenshots at the end of this presentation as well. So quickly, I just want to talk about um, these are. I'm not going to read this whole entire slide because I want to make sure we get through the entire presentation. But when we're talking about progress notes related to crisis service, here's you know some of the key elements is that we want to make sure we address the urgency, and the immediacy of the situation. Um, we want to detail you know if the individual requires psychiatric hospitalization um, or if they didn't. What you know what what is likely to happen? How are they likely to decompensate? Um, any aftercare or safety plans that we developed and any resources and contact um, that will participate in follow-up. So we just want to make sure we include some of those um, elements. And again, you can read this information and move on to the next. Um, for group notes, for group services, so um, there will be a piece where you will need to include the, the group goals and the purpose. Um, but also there's this interaction element that you will want to comment in, comment on, you know, the group therapy as a modality, there's the, the intent of that sometimes is for um, individuals to develop skills. And so, um, you know, you, you will want to um, talk about how they are participating in the group or not participating in a group that would be relevant. Um, and so you, you want to make sure that you note that. Um, and any, again, in any of this, any newly identified issues of clinical concern that impact functioning, um, you want to make sure that you, you make note of. And also just um, notes for termination and transition. And I want to make sure not to um, confuse anyone in, in reference to uh, thinking of this note as like the discharge summary. This is not to be confused with the discharge summary. Um, the discharge summary provides way more detailed information around the course of treatment. This may be a termination note. So this might be where you um, detail the family's understanding and, and agreement with the termination plan, um, what their next steps are going to be, you know, where they were in terms of achieving their goals, um, and a warm handoff if necessary. And so you're going to include that um, in the note. So it probably will likely be your last face-to-face -face visit um, with the individual. And then a subsequent discharge summary would follow. Um, but just to, make, just to make mention that that would have some little, little bit of different elements um, in it as well. And so I've also provided an example of a group note for, for you to review on your own time. Just again, just to frame how you can incorporate some of these elements into the note um, where you're, you're still, you're putting the main salient points in the note, but again, you could do it very briefly and you're relaying that you are collaborating 
um, working with the individual being person-centered. So this, again, you can look at that on your own time, just a sample. And so, now I'm uh, going to pass this, it back off to Ann. <laughs> Sorry, Ann, go ahead. <laughs> that's, no, that's, that's fine. This, no, I'm going to keep this really, uh, uh, you know, short, uh, and that is that the, uh, you know, the notes really have to be entered um, as soon as possible, ideally the same day. Some people do notes during the actual sessions that they're having with families, um, and some people find that a really great opportunity to be very transparent with families about what's being written and get families input. Is this right? Did I understand your reaction to this correctly? Um, I don't mean by any stretch to underestimate the challenge of doing this. I know that you all are writing notes in your car and while you eat your lunch very quickly, or maybe you didn't get a lunch and you're trying to get them done at the end of the day. Um, they can't always be done that same day. Um, but it really is important not to wait because the clarity of the details really does start to dissipate, especially when you're seeing a lot of families and juggling a lot of information. So, um, you know, certainly your agency will have policies around the timeframes that are required for you to get notes done. But, um, and it, it's the kind of thing where you may really want to get together with folks and share some strategies about how to do this. One key is to try to learn how to get the required information in the note and not more than that, because then you won't be writing um, such long notes. Um, but it really is important, and you'll notice that the accuracy of your notes improves if you can get them done um, as soon as possible. Uh, and I know that, that that's a challenge. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass this back to you to talk about um, quickly about a couple of documentation methods that folks know about. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so this is um there's some documentation methods that are out there that um that some of you are probably familiar with, the very clinical formats of documentation. But if again if you're looking for a way to kind of um help kind of structure you in, in writing your note, these these might be helpful. Um, you can look them up online. I'm not going to go through all of the details, but it does. This just speaks, let me just clarify, this speaks to the clinical element of the note, does not speak to the compliance and medical necessity pieces necessarily of the note. So um, just wanted to offer this up in case people were looking for um, ways to kind of help them structure the, the clinical content and how to kind of write it with brevity, um, that, that this might be helpful. And some of that may actually be prescribed by your EHR, your electronic health record, or your electronic medical record, or by your agency. They may have a preference for a certain kind of format. Yeah. Um, the other thing we want to talk about is what doesn't go in a note. Um, and I think of that has touched on most of these things along the way. But speculation, your personal feelings or judgments about the uh, client, Individual uh, information about things that people, information that the client has shared with you that's not necessarily pertinent to that individual. So they may have told you a story about something that uh, their partner did or some member of their family did that, you know, may be helpful for you to hear about in the context of your work with them, but doesn't go in the note. The note really needs to be focused on what's relevant to that individual. Um, also, it's, again, keeping within your scope of practice. So not coming to conclusions or making clinical judgments um, if that's not your role or if that's not your role in this particular moment. Um, and also being very careful about not just writing down a blow-by-blow -blow account of what happened during your time working with that individual, but really focusing on the key elements of the note. So uh, again, a couple of general considerations. Um, really reviewing these notes, and this kind of gets back to the tone that you want your notes to um, have that reflects your beliefs and your way of interacting with the individual or the family that you're working with. So when you look at the note, I think it's a good test to see if you would be comfortable if that note had been written about yourself or your family um, and avoiding any kinds of judgment um, or reframing some tough situations. So if the family's missed three appointments, you know, you have the option to say the family doesn't care about services or you can have a conversation with the family and, and find out it's been difficult for them to get there or they're struggling because this, these issues are difficult for them and we talked about ways to make it more comfortable. So some reframing, some being as positive as you can and respectful as you can and trying to make sure that any biases that you might have uh, don't come through in the, in the note. So um, this is just a screenshot of the NYSCRI, um, uh list of forms. 
These are available, there's a link that was provided earlier there on the Office of Mental Health website, and there is a manual and some guidelines, a lot of resource documents, and even some webinars from 2010. If you uh, really like to listen to webinars, there's some uh, guidance webinars on the NICE free um, resources. And one other resource here that we're sharing with you, this is something that our colleagues at CCSI developed, and it's a kind of a progress note a uh, quick reference guide that includes a lot of the things that we talked about today that's a little easier to carry around than a 36 slide uh, PowerPoint. Um, and you might want to add some of your own notes to this and, and keep that in, uh, you know, wherever you keep your notes to help you use as a checklist. So we're going to attempt a poll again, and um, then we'll uh, go to some questions. So everyone answer as quickly as you can. Jocelyn will give you maybe 30 seconds to answer, and then she'll, um, uh, close the poll. While we're doing that, I'll remind everybody in case folks joined late that the slides for this presentation can be found on the CTAC uh, website on the calendar. So if you go to today's date, um, you'll see, I think it's listed under upcoming events even though it's today, but if you navigate to today's date, you'll see this webinar listed and uh, click on that and you'll see the slides are there. Um, also, there are two additional webinars in this series coming up and you can uh, register for those on the CTAC website as well. Uh, yep. One and of them is, oh, go ahead, January 25th and February 15th. Thanks, Ariane. I also just wanted to mention um, that this this uh, presentation is, is jam full of kind of um, information, and so uh, to not think that this um, webinar w it will make you a master necessarily in, in writing progress notes, you know, tomorrow. However, it definitely provides you the guidance um, that you begin. And so, if you think about this process as a as a kind of ongoing process, where as you um, take this information and you start to write your notes, you know, it will it will be a while before you kind of get it you know, you get it 100% good where you're, like, able to do that relatively quickly and know all of the elements that need to go into it. So it really is a bit of a process. Uh, when I used to supervise clinicians, it would take them anywhere um, from, you know, three to six months to really get, get this process down such that they could write their notes in a very quick fashion but write a quality note and quick, meaning, you know, relatively within five, ten minutes. Um, and, and include all of those elements. So I just kind of want to remind people that it's not like you're a walk out of here tomorrow and can probably detail, you know, it takes a while to learn the kind of concepts. Right, and you know, please, uh, so in terms of the results of the poll, it looks like folks are, um, you know, perhaps most comfortable with, um, I, I see really mixed results. Some people feeling neutral, some people agreeing and strongly disagreeing, or strongly agreeing that they, are comfortable with how to write a progress note that reflects the treatment plan goals and also that reflects client and family input. Uh, it doesn't look like uh, anybody's really struggling with that, um, but that they're, you know, moving in the direction of feeling a little bit more comfortable. It'd be really helpful if you include in your chat comments any areas that you're struggling with that we didn't cover in today's webinar so that we can be sure when we structure the office hours and the final uh, webinar that we can make sure we address any of the challenges that you are having with note taking, um, and that will help us, you know, sort of tune those last two webinars to meet your needs. The final thing I'm going to do really quickly because I want to get to a couple of questions, and this is for those of you who are supervising staff, we're really strongly recommending that you develop some habits in terms of your uh, supervision patterns where you're looking at progress notes with staff, not just for the information, but actually for the structure of the note. Help them see what they can, you know, what they're missing, what they might be able to leave out. Ask them to rewrite them if necessary. It's all part of the learning process. Um, and you may need, you may find that you have kind of consistent problems and you need to do kind of an in-service in training. Um, also really highlight that um, 
link to the, go to, to the treatment plan and the requirements for meeting medical necessity, you'll find that's really important in not having notes rejected. So you have to justify why you're providing the service um, and really make that link. So that should be clear in their note. And you might also want to choose, you know, one of the core values to focus on for a period of time and, and work with staff around how they can make sure that those values are reflected in the notes and in their work. So what I want to do now is um, um, have an opportunity to respond to any questions that people have. Um, and one of the questions that I saw uh, had to do with a client call. And uh, that I'm going to read these questions so that you have an opportunity to uh, answer them because you have more experience than I do with uh, actually supporting staff to do progress notes. But the one question is, if a client calls and you return the call but can't get through to them, um, should you document that and how do you document that? Yeah, so so if a client uh, were to call me and, and leave me a message, I, I definitely would document that, and I might say something. Um, received, a, you know, received a call from the family, and if they left a message, I would be mindful of what the, you know, I'd put that in. Left the family left a message that they were, you know, not going to be able to meet with me for the next three weeks because, you know, I so I put that in, and I I would say provider attempted to return call you know, family did not respond. So again, it's that piece of just making sure you document what you're doing. The follow-up actions does not have to be long. You could do that in a sentence or two, um, you know, depending on the nature of the call. Um, so it's it really brief, but just that, so when someone looks at the record and the family says we called and we called and we called and we never got a response back, you know, you could go back and refer to the record and say, actually the provider attempted to call you, you know, left you a message, Blah, blah, blah. And that's actually happened several times. So uh, very, very briefly, yes. Okay. So um, about, are electronic signatures acceptable? Yeah, yes. If your EHR has an electronic signature, yes. Okay. Um, and I, uh, it says, uh, what about needing to write down a starting and ending time and not just the duration? So uh, our yeah. sample so note some, had duration. Yeah, our sample note has duration. So. Um, some would say put the start and end time to be as efficient, but we have built with just doing the duration um, as well. You know, like, so I know that it was 62 minutes, but I may, you know, I may know that they came in, and, and I've, I should say this, sometimes EHRs are very good with documenting time of arrivals, you know, and time, and so some of that information might be automatically captured, but you should, if you are handwriting a note, you should put the, you know, start time and end time. Okay, so someone else is asking if a mother attends a case conference, can we submit that information as well? I'm, I think I'm this not is sure getting at the issue of, I think it's about, uh, so the child is probably the client um, and the mother is attending um, a, a conference about the child. I guess the issue would be, how do we document work with what we call collateral, so people aren't the identified uh, client um, in our progress notes? So you would just document, if they're collateral, you just, um, under, you know, you would just document kind of the support that they're providing um, to the individual. So the work that you've done on the individual's behalf, and really, if you remember, collaterals are really intended to support the work that you're doing with an identified individual. And so if someone is significant, like, you know, someone is sitting in on something that's important, um, and they're part of the record, I think that's, that's a piece there. Usually if they're collateral, they're identified in some way, shape, or form in that record, then you would just note, you know, like um, whatever, you know, parent or, you know, um, teacher attended, you know, this session to discuss. But it really has to be linked to, uh, again, the treatment plan, the goals and objectives. So there has to be some reason for why they're attending. Right. And, and I think in some of our conversations with managed care organizations, they really want to know how your work with that collateral is directly tied to the goals for that particular right. uh, child or right. an adult that you're right. working with. Right. If a client appears angry or depressed during a meeting, and that could be a sign of decompensation, would that be something that you would note or would that be considered subjective? What you would note is there, yes, that would be something that you would note. That would be important to note. It's pertinent information. If they, if, a, if an individual or family differ from baseline, um, that's always important to note. But what I would say is that you would note it in behavioral terms. So saying depressed could take the form of many different things. But what does that mean for this client? You know, client appear, you know, client arrived 
was tearful, was crying, you know, you want to be behavioral in what that, what that actually means. Because just by saying depressed, I don't know what that means in terms of for that particular individual. Okay. So um, another question came in about documenting related to collaterals, and that is what should you document if a collateral does not want the client to know they gave the info to the clinician? So a collateral contacted you uh, with some important information about a client, but they don't want the client to know. Yeah, that's a, that's a little, um, that's a bit of a difficult question because I'm not, so here, so here's my, um, my take on that. If a collateral is working with you to support an individual, I think it's important that, that there be open communication. There are specific certain circumstances where maybe that um, is not, would not be okay, and, and, and there's many nuances to that, but like I'm thinking of like in a case of like a sexual abuse with a child, maybe there'd be some issues around that. But if not, you know, I would say that it's, it's probably better to have both the collateral and the, you know, the individual in treatment understand what that means to be in treatment, what it means to be a support to this person, and talk about not necessarily keeping secrets. I, that, that to me gets a little kind of hairy um, when you're doing that, so I'd really talk mm -hmm. about, I'd really have some conversation uh, about the, the roles, the collateral, and just really be upfront about that. Mm -hmm. Again, unless it unless it was really there, again, there's some very um, specific situations where may, that may not be able to be possible, but otherwise, that's uh, that's what I would encourage. Okay, um, but you can always you can always document if a collateral calls you though, like if a collateral calls you and gives you information that you would document in the record. So, but remember, it's that individual's record. So you see how that could get very hairy in terms of if everyone's not on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, so we have another question which says if a client presents in crisis for a problem not addressed in the treatment plan, do you have to modify the treatment plan at the end of visit and end of the visit in order to be paid? So that's um so that's a a, a kind of regulatory issue a billing question. And the, so the purpose of this um, documentation, documentation training is not really to speak to that because that really is dependent upon programming rules and regulations. So I would say, though, if there is a change in, a, in an individual or family status, that that get documented, and if it requires an update to a treatment plan, that that get updated um, as necessary. Okay. I'm going to take uh, two more quick questions because we've reached the hour, and there are a few other questions, including, you know, some really uh, complex ones around what you do and don't document in difficult situations that I think we can forward to the office hours time. I think they're really uh, excellent questions. Um, but uh, is there a specific language that should be used in a progress note? And I assume what people are talking about there is English or Spanish or some other language, um, and that I would imagine that English it, at this point is considered the sort of standard for documenting um, in EHRs? Yes, English, um, well, there, yes. So I've seen, but I've also seen notes documented in Spanish, however, know that it, it that you kind of have to work that out through your own um, agency. But I, the, the notes that were documented in Spanish were also documented in English, so they were documented in both ways. Um, and that's okay. because we served we served a non English speaking population, so that was appropriate. So, so that question would really have to be answered at the agency level. What made sense? Okay. Um, and the last question we'll take um, for today is: um, Did you have any thoughts about um, coordination with a client's primary care doctors? Um, at, you know, obviously that's a big topic, but as it relates to documentation, have you had that experience or? Any sharing of records between primary care doctors and uh, clients? Absolutely. So, um, you know, especially as a, as we move towards transformational stuff in your state, that's not going to be uncommon where you will be sharing. And sometimes it's really important that you share information because perhaps an individual is, um, you know, prescribed a med out of from the behavioral health side that really is going to be impacting a physical health issue, or we need to alert primary care physicians like we've prescribed this med, so we you're going to need to see this individual and you know monitor them. So it's it's really important I think to have that link in communication, and so you would just document that like you would 
like you would if you were um, collaborating with another, um, you know, a, another uh, community organization. Uh, you and you would only document again pertinent information relative to the treatment plans and goals. So in that situation that I gave, it might be pertinent to put in what the psychiatrist has prescribed and why it is that you've identified that you've needed to um, talk with the primary care physician because it is impacting um, this, you know, a particular condition that someone may have, and all of that would be relative, relative to the treatment. So I think it's just to be mindful. We would not want to be randomly inserting people's health information into a record with no purpose. Terrific. Thank you, Yvette. I want to thank everyone for their participation today, and I know this is a topic for which there are still many, many uh, questions. Uh, please feel free to send your questions to us through the CTAC website. Um, you can put a note on there saying, I have this question about documentation, and you get it to us in the next uh, week or so, we can uh, begin to inc incorporate some of those questions into upcoming webinars. But thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to seeing you um, in the other webinars in this series. Thank you.